As a card-carrying member of the PC Master Race, I can't overstate how important Quake is. From a technological standpoint, it's one of the most important games ever released. It was 1996, and FPS games weren't really 3D yet. And then there was Quake, which was super fast, ultra-violent, smooth as butter, running a fully 3D engine created by super genius alien in person suit John Carmack. So Quake was kind of big, spawning three sequels, four if you count Quake Champions, two of those being exclusively multiplayer games, which would be just the worst if Quake 3 wasn't the greatest deathmatch game ever conceived. And being on the PC, Quake had mods. You might have heard of a couple of these. There was this one called Team Fortress, which went on to be a Half-Life mod, and also an Aliens mod that got shut down by Fox, but is still all over the internet. But then you have something like today's game, X-Men, The Ravages of Apocalypse. It's a Quake total conversion that was commercially sold, as in you needed Quake to play it, on top of buying this thing in a store. I know what you're thinking, wouldn't it be awesome to play a game where you get to be an X-Man with his superpowers and stuff, cutting motherfuckers up like Wolverine, being a weak pussy like Cyclops? It's an interesting idea, let's see how the story goes. Apocalypse and an unknown ally are making clones. The world has already been apocalypsed, but Magneto is still around and he's not gonna let some ancient Egyptian god take over the world, because that's his job. So he creates a cybernetic soldier to go and stop this, even though you would think Magneto would be able to do it. So yeah, this guy becomes a lot of guns, and it's his job to storm the Citadel of Apocalypse and take out all these X-Men clones. This is actually pretty good. The artwork, the sound effects, it's a nice presentation. 8 out of 10. But I don't read comic books down here, I play video games and occasionally watch movies. So let's start the thing up, and you're brought into the intro level, which is a goddamn huge recreation of the X-Mansion. Pretty impressive for Quake 1. There's these messages telling you what everything is and where you are, and also that 99 out of 100 of these doors can't be opened. Okay. Tell you what, you see this? This is modding. This is the shit. This is why the PC is the best. Let's play the game, jump in on normal skill. Oh my god! <laughs> Okay, I need to get into a little background because this is important to know going in. This started as a non-commercial Quake mod, and then Marvel calls up the development team and says, Hey, can you guys make us one of those video games we've been hearing so much about? And understandably, they said, Yeah, sure. And Marvel said, Yeah, but we need it in three months so we can get it out for Christmas. I'm going to say this right now because I'm going to get very angry at this game. This is Marvel's fault. Because everything in X-Men Ravages of Apocalypse almost approaches being nearly done. What does that mean? Let's talk about how you dropped into the first level holding every weapon, but also that you can make it through using exactly three of them. You get your special power fist, it's cool looking, does decent enough damage for a last ditch weapon, then your shotgun, one of the absolutely indispensable weapons. It does good damage, but it has this thing where it fires twice and reloads. Okay, that's fine for a shotgun, I'll put up with that. Then the chain gun, which is just the worst. It has all these barrels, fires nine times, then needs to stop and then start firing again, contrary to how every machine gun in every game ever in the history of games has operated. In this kind of game, your machine gun is vital to stun locking, to crowd control, being a non-stop spray of bullets. While this fires two shells at a time, yes, shells, eats up your entire ammo supply, and in no way does even remotely the same kind of damage as the shotgun. So if you run out of ammo, which you will, and want to rely on the shotgun, which you will, you won't have any fucking ammo for it. Don't use it. Don't ever use it. Also, both these weapons are clearly belt-fed, so why do they need to reload at all? Then you got your fire-based weapons, a decent enough little fireball launcher that fires three times before having to stop. Okay, sure, I just, I guess we're just gonna do that for every weapon. Then you get a flamethrower, and the effect and the way it works looks great. You know, for something done in the Quake engine, it's fantastic. It's also practically useless. You can unload your entire ammo supply and kill maybe two enemies. This being the same ammo supply as the fireball launcher, which is infinitely more useful and effective. Then you got your grenade launcher, which is basically like Quake's grenade launcher, except bouncier and with a higher rate of fire. It's useless once you get the rocket launcher, which is double-barreled and shoots two homing rockets at a time. One rocket would be fine, but okay, we'll do two. Seems a little wasteful. This is your other indispensable weapon, even though the homing rockets will sometimes go wherever the fuck they want. And then there's the magic energy ball you summon from your hand. You can hold the fire key down to charge it, and it explodes, and it can launch other explosive projectiles. It's occasionally useful. 
you get all these weapons at the very start. Here's one of the biggest problems of this game. There is no progression of your character. Now, in your modern games, you can have skill trees and such, but in the old days, game designers would make it so that you would gradually acquire new weapons, making the player stronger while the battles became bigger and the more powerful monsters started showing up later. Quake did it. Four times, actually. There's a twist on this formula, and it's what I like to call Valve pissing the players off relentlessly until finally giving up the goods. In the Half-Life 1 chapter surface tension, you get chased across multiple maps by this goddamn helicopter. Then you get a rocket launcher to take it down. Finally. Same for having to go through half a level of zombies without a shotgun, Ravenholm. Here, brother. Brother, 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 brother! Come closer! You've stirred up hell, <laughs> man after my own heart. Here, I have a more suitable gun for you. You'll need it. Catch! Good. Yeah, the gravity gun is great, but it's always going to be outmatched by the simplicity of pulling a trigger, hearing a boom, and watching the bastard in front of you become dead. Hearing that click click, and making the bastard next to him feel stupid for trying the same thing. But when you get all these weapons at once, and for the most part all of the enemies at once, there's no real sense of progression. You start here, and you stay here until the end. Now, the enemies, you'll recognize some of them. Wolverine, Beast, Cyclops, Rogue, Iceman, Bishop, Archangel, Gambit, Storm, Psylocke... I didn't know half of the characters' names, to be honest, but Quake gives you death messages to tell you, and I saw those a lot. Ravages of Apocalypse is hard. Brutally... Brutally hard. Mostly because of the enemy design. Certain Quake monsters have attacks that were carried over the mutants in pretty fitting ways. Cyclops has a weak little pew-pew laser, like this guy from Quake, Wolverine leaps at you and slashes like the Fiend, Storm has lightning like the Shambler, Psylocke has a sword like the Knight, Wolverine and Iceman die and get back up kinda like the zombies, Wolverine because he's got healing powers and Iceman because he's a pain in my ass. He's the only thing the flamethrower is good for, you can melt him. You can just blow them up with rockets, too. But this doesn't scratch the surface of the more sadistic aspects of these enemies. Iceman can freeze you in place for a few seconds, leaving you open to attack, and boy does he like to do it. In theory, you could drop him into a lava pit and T-1000 his ass, but not in the game because it hates me. He walks on lava! Storm can toss you around with wind, but also make you immediately turn 180 degrees, and you land facing the opposite direction. Phoenix can trap you, lift you up, and just start fucking you. Any of them alone are a problem, but when you have one or more at a time, or even one mixed in with any other type of monster, you are in deep shit. You better learn to quick save. And you see just about all of these enemies on the first level, and every level after that. They all take insane amounts of punishment, the weakest of them can take six rockets to the face. And you're not gonna have a ton of rockets on hand at first, so you'll be using the shotgun. Get used to this rhythm, it's most of the game, when you're not having your ass handed to you. The ten or so levels are mostly huge, open-ended, fairly cryptic, and have way too many find three switches hidden all around this map to do a thing that you may or may not be aware is a thing. I spent upwards of 30 minutes wandering around when the mutants aren't running a train on me trying to find a switch hidden somewhere. For example, a tiny little button on the side of this computer that's in a room that I had to find three tiny buttons randomly scattered across the level to open in the first place. On the third level, I spent forever looking for a gold key to open a sarcophagus which I only found out wasn't decoration, was, in fact, a door that required a key after looking everywhere else, and it turns out the gold key can be seen at the start if you're not playing using the source port I was using. There's also four weapon pieces you have to collect throughout the levels, sometimes hidden, sometimes not, and these are required to face the bosses. You actually have to collect them twice over the course of these levels, and I'll get back to that shit in a few minutes. The weapon piece in level three also does not spawn. So I'm like, okay, let me just kill myself and restart the level and see if it magically appears. It doesn't. And also it took away the weapon pieces I already had. So what now? So I'm supposed to not finish the game? That's not an option. Well, okay, it is an option, but not for me. Finish the game, CV-11. I, I can't. The game isn't gonna let me. Initializing testicular nodes. Look, it's not my fault. Charging testicular nodes. We're gonna shock your balls off, boy. Off? So I switched to another Quake source port and started the whole thing again because even though this is a bad game, it's not as bad as internal ball tasing. So the weapon pieces finally spawn and you better get them because you won't make it past the halfway point without them. 
It's kind of like in Castlevania Symphony of the Night, where you have to get the gold ring and the silver ring and the holy glasses so you can make your way into the inverted castle, except Symphony of the Night is awesome and X-Men Ravages of Apocalypse is endlessly soul-crushing. <laughs> Another thing about the enemies in this game is that they're beautifully rendered. I can tell that very talented people worked on this. You're going to hear the phrase, for the Quake engine, to qualify a lot of stuff here, and there's a reason for that. Quake models are primitive, the animations are vertex-based instead of skeletal, meaning that the people making it had to individually animate the frames instead of using bones inside the model to create the keyframes. Anyway, it's a bitch to do and that's why nobody did it after 1997. Having all of the X-Men look this good in this detail to the point where you can tell them all apart pretty easily, and honestly, it's some of the best 3D modeling work I've seen from the era. I mean, just look at Wolverine. Primitive? Sure, but you know who that is. Also, special mention goes to Cannonball, an X-Men I've never heard of who rockets around, and that's a really cool effect, the way he flies around like a homing missile. But from a gameplay perspective, it's fucking horrible. This motherfucker is completely invincible when he flies around, and he pushes you around, and it's really good at getting to you, so he's knocking you around while you're trying to shoot at something else that might be knocking you around, so you're dealing with all this shit so you can get the pieces to the super weapon, which is the only thing that can destroy Apocalypse, the villain from the game's title. But he's not the final boss, because it turns out that he has a sinister ally. And if you've seen anything relating to X-Men, you know that the sinister ally is actually Mr. Sinister, who is almost as big of a threat as General Grievous, Dr. Evil, and Professor Chaos. I don't even care if people have been making fun of that name for 30 years, it's ridiculous. Also, can someone tell me why on Wikipedia when I look some of this shit up it says that Apocalypse is a fictional supervillain? Is there a page for non-fictional supervillains? You know what, the bosses are better in this than in Quake, but that's kind of a low bar to set. Quake's bosses were kind of shit. I know a lot of you out there haven't played Quake, so here's some spoilers for you. The first boss in Quake gets killed when you run around his arena and lower conveniently placed things that electrocute him. All you do is telefrag the second and last boss of the game, Elder God Shub Nagurath. You know, one and done, piece of cake. You actually have to fight the bosses in Ravages of Apocalypse, which puts him a cut above. So collecting the four weapon pieces, sure, okay, I even accidentally found the secret level exit in level two, so that's cool, even though it just led to more death. Halfway through you get to Apocalypse, who is huge, until you hit four switches, get a thing, and use the super weapon against him. He shrinks, you shoot him, you kill him, there you go. But there's still Mr. Sinister, so you go on to the second episode, which, to its credit, has prettier levels. You've seen most of this game with the struggles with the mutants until the last level where it throws in some fucking weird puzzles, like this one with the light path, I don't understand how I did it, even with the walkthrough, it just kinda happened. Mr. Sinister shows up a few times to taunt you, and try to kill you if you don't immediately shoot him, then he just teleports away. Now that you've collected the weapon pieces for the second time, you have to get this energy orb to power it again, and then shoot Mr. Sinister until you run out of juice, and only then can you kill him. He teleports around and you shoot him with rockets and he dies. The boss battles are actually pretty easy. So now that I've completed X-Men The Ravages of Apocalypse, and despite the game looking great, it's actually never-ending frustration. I get that they didn't have enough time to test it, I get that Marvel was being dicks and that maybe their decision-making in the 90s wasn't the best. Like, hey guys, we're gonna launch a commercially licensed not-standalone Quake TC, where you kill all the X-Men, and we're gonna have it for Christmas, so all those kids who love Quake TCs can get it in their stockings. What the fuck were they thinking?